the organizers, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a very interesting conference, but something that makes me much more happy is that finally uh, a lot of colleagues who had opportunity a uh, few years ago to meet very often are again in the same room, and I'm very happy to see so many old friends and colleagues uh, together. So today I will talk about codification of civil law in Croatia, but I would like to um, focus uh, on developments after accession, uh, independence and accession of uh, Croatia uh, to, to the EU. Um, a lot has been already said about developments uh, in former Yugoslavia and in um, all Yugoslavias we had. Uh, so I will focus only on civil law reform after independence and uh, during the accession process. Uh, and also I would like to point some challenges uh, Perhaps they are not so typical for Croatia, but for all of our countries because of so many crises we have in um, last decades. Financial crisis, COVID crisis, uh, um, now energy crisis, and how all these crises uh, influence um, uh, development, uh, development of uh, civil law. Especially I will talk about Croatia. Uh, for those who are not, uh, uh, who, who do not know uh, a lot about Croatia, we are independent states from 1991, and then we started a lot of um, transitions in our um, society. State transition, uh, transition from the war to peace. We had war. Uh, social trans transition, uh, economic transition, legal transition as well. Um, uh, we are member state uh, from 2013. Uh, from the, uh, the beginning of this year, we are a member of Eurozone and uh, Schengen area, and um, now we are trying to develop our economy in line with new developments uh, regarding uh, Euro and uh, Schengen area. Uh, something that is also very important to say when we are talking about Croatia is economic situation. As you can see, um, GDP in Croatia is 25% uh, lower uh, in compare with EU average, and uh, this fact also influences the developments in civil law, specifically during the economic crisis and now in energy crisis. So after um, independence, uh, there was a lot of challenges uh, for Croatia. And as you can see, one of the challenge was, of course, legal challenge, because we have to harmonize our uh, law with EU law. And we have to recodify a lot of pieces of civil law legislation we had in socialist time. Uh, so uh, the, the main idea for this process of codification was on one side to establish a new civil law system based on private ownership and market freedoms, and on the other side to harmonize uh, our law with EU market freedoms and EU law. So it was um, a parallel uh, transition and these two parallel reforms were very uh, challenging for our legislator. We had in this reform a successive approach. So uh, there was no uh, reform uh, by introducing a comprehensive civil code. Uh, we decided to go step by step and first to change and to reform uh, civil law fields that are more important for market economy. Because in that moment we had, in the beginning, we had the problems with property, 
with the labor uh, law, with um, bankruptcy law, with enforcement law, uh, also with company law. And as you can see, uh, the first uh, acts we enacted after independence were uh, acts that, are that were important for market economy and market freedoms. So, and because of that, still we do not have civil code, we do not have commercial code, and I must say that um, in the moment there is no project about civil code, there is no discussion about civil code. We are still have the same approach to uh, regulate specific fields of civil law, of private law, <coughs> by specific uh, acts. Uh, the important legal source of Croatian civil law are, because of that, very a uh, big number of specific acts like Property Act, Land Registration Act, uh, Obligations Act, Family Act, Inheritance Act. So we have a lot of specific acts regulating some specific fields of, um, proper, of uh, private law. So when we are talking about the property law reform that started in 1997, um, I, uh, I will mention only some few points I think that, that, that are important. Uh, we introduced, again, very general traditional principles of property law. <clears throat> and on the other side, we had to change a lot of rules uh, from socialist times that were not in line with traditional principles of property law, such as principle of superficie solo cedit, because this principle was uh, not in force uh, during socialist time when we are talking about socially owned land. Uh, also, we introduced some new property rights uh, and new system of secured transactions. And that what was uh, perhaps the most difficult part in this reform was transformation of socially owned ownership into private ownership. So we had to uh, introduce uh, special rules on transition to a new property regulation. And uh, I would say that this is usually always the most difficult part in such kind of uh, reform, because we had to uh, take care on acquired rights uh, and to regulate this transition to new property rights, to, to individual property uh, right on a way to have in mind and to take care on already acquired rights on socially owned property. Um, and we did it on a way that uh, in our, in, in, uh, in the, uh, at the end of our property act, there are specific rules that, that uh, say that those who had some specific rights on socially owned property are now owners. Now, now they have property rights on land or uh, movables in socially owned property. The same was also with the re-establishment of superficie solo cedit principle, because in that cases we also had to take care on rights that individuals already had on flats or buildings built on socially owned land. So it was very complicated, uh, and we still have a lot of problems in practice uh, concerning um, uh, this regulation. Uh, very often, one of the biggest problem is to define who is the owner, who is the owner of the land. Uh, the second part of uh, property law um, reform was adjustment to EU law uh, about market freedoms uh, because we had to change our rules, our very specific rules on acquisition of land by foreigners. Uh, these rules were not in line with EU market freedoms, specifically with uh, freedom of movement of capital. And so we had to change these rules and to abolish for nationals from uh, other EU countries all the restrictions we had for acquiring the uh, land, the, the uh, ownership on, of the land. And as you can see, we uh, 
in fact, introduced very, very uh, liberal rules already from 2009 because in our association agreement we had obligations to adjust our rules on property law uh, four years after um, uh, uh, coming in force stabilization agreement. Uh, the only excluded sector in this, in this moment uh, for uh, EU uh, uh, nationals is agricultural land, but uh, this um, a sector is excluded till the beginning of July this year, so it was something what was negotiated uh, and what was put in accession treaty and after uh, July 2023 we have to apply, apply the same non-discriminatory rules also for uh, nationals from other EU countries uh, regarding acquisition of um, agricultural land. Uh, for nationals from third countries, we still have uh, discriminatory rules, restrictive rules, and for acquiring um, the land by contract, we, uh, the, the foreigner needs to have a prior authorization by uh, Ministry of Justice and reciprocity, and agricultural land and forest land are still excluded, so it is not possible to be acquired by foreigners, non-EU uh, foreigners. So this is something what uh, perhaps we can discuss later. Uh, when we are talking about obligation law reform, uh, since 2006 we have enforced the new Obligations Act, very similar to previous one, as Professor Dudas already said. And uh, in fact, this Obligations Act is uh, based on very, very traditional, very classical obligations principles. Um, and something what perhaps is interesting to say that we have no commercial code. So in our Obligations Act, we have so-called monistic approach. So the same rules for civil and commercial contracts with some exceptions for uh, commercial contracts. Um, the general part of Obligations Act, because we have no civil code, we have no general part of civil code, is often used as general part uh, for, for private law uh, <clears throat> in general. Uh, the biggest novelty, as Professor Dudas already said, in our obligations law reform is a shift from a so-called subjective concept to the objective concept of non-material damage. So <clears throat> in the old uh, Obligations Act, uh, there was a rule that uh, non-material damage was defined as pain, mental pain or physical pain, but now um, non-material damage is violation of rights of personality. These rights are defined in Obligations Act. It's, uh, it's one open list, and it means that now it is possible to sue for non-material damage also in the cases when there was no pain, there was no physical pain, because uh, it is enough to prove violation <coughs> of rights of personality. When we are talking about um, family and inheritance, law reform. I will not go in detail. I just want to say that we, ha <coughs> we have a specific act on same-sex union act um, um, partnership. And um, this act is in fact in line with family act and inheritance act. And as you can see, uh, when we are talking about matrimonial property regime, the same rules apply to all these unions, so to marriage, to uh, extramarital union, to same-sex union. Uh, we made some changes and now um, the, the form of uh, common property is co-ownership with equal shares, so it's a little bit different in compare with old rules we have. And in inheritance law, uh, I must say that a spouse or extramarital partner or same-sex partner is equal when, it, uh, when he or she inherits with uh, um, children of deceased 
person. And in the second cl uh, class, um, we have uh, new rules in compare with all inheritance act from former Yugoslavia that in fact the spouse uh, has priority over brother and sister of uh, deceased person. So if um, uh, there, there, the deceased spouse uh, uh, had no uh, parents, uh, all uh, what has to be inherited uh, is inherited by spouse or uh, extramarital or same-sex partner. So they have uh, priority uh, over uh, brothers and sisters of deceased persons. So these are only some examples of what we changed uh, during the last year. What were the effects of these law reforms? So first of all, modernization of national law, adjustment to market economy. Uh, there is a, no, a lot of new legal institutions, um, protection of new values in national uh, legal order. Uh, also, I would say that protection of human rights is much more better. Uh, there are also some, a lot of new instruments uh, for cross-border enforcement of rights, for cross-border uh, judicial cooperation. Uh, but unfortunately, there are also a lot of problems, as always. Uh, so first of all, I would say that uh, a lot of rules are incomplete and unsystematic. Uh, that we have very often uh, frequent uh, changes of our laws. Uh, also, our system is, because we do not have civil code, very segmented, very fragmented, I will show it. And something what I already mentioned, these, these transitional regimes are very complicated. Uh, for example, you can see here, we have a Consumer Protection Act, and mostly all directives are um, transposed in Consumer Protection Act. But uh, on the other side, some uh, directives, consumer directives, are transposed in Obligations Act that has subsidiary application. Uh, but on the other side, there are also a lot of separate acts on consumer protection that are also priority in front of uh, over consumer protection. So in every uh, case, we have to make a kind of patchwork of all rules to, to define which rules we really need to apply on specific consumer contract. On the other side, there is also uh, a lot of situations when we have, in fact, the same rules that regulate more or less the same situation. There is a lot of overlapping in the system. And uh, because, for example, in Obligations Act, we have very general rules and a lot of principles that we have to apply. And on the other side, there is a lot of specific acts that regulate some specific rules that can be also, um, in fact, that we have to interpret these rules uh, on the base of these general principles. And something what is also uh, very problematic, we have a lot of changes of our legislation. For example, here you can see how often we change some of our acts, uh, especially um, we often change our Civil Procedure Act, but also uh, many other substantial uh, laws we changed very often. It's not only because of harmonization with EU law. Uh, it's very often because we are, I would say, still in research, in, in search for effective remedies for protection of individual rights. And because of that, there is, as you can see, a lot of changes in uh, civil law. Um, there are also problems with understanding of EU law principles, uh, with um, undeveloped legal and economic uh, infrastructure. There are also some problems with uh, 
knowledge and awareness of individual rights conferred by EU law. For example, here you can see these are uh, consumer scoreboard uh, 2023, and unfortunately, uh, Croatia is almost on the last place when we are talking about the level of knowledge of consumers about their rights. And this is, it's a lot about the European average. So this is something what is perhaps not a legal problem, but it's a problem of education and of um, lack of information for consumers about their rights. And something what I would like to stress on the end is that there are also uh, a lot of changes in civil law system because of so different crises uh, we had, not only Croatia, but the whole world, uh, the Europe, um, when we are talking about financial crisis, about COVID crisis, about energy crisis we are facing now. Uh, and because of all these crises and needs to protect uh, individuals, um, I think that in many countries, including Croatia, a lot of very traditional civil law rules uh, have been changed. And uh, uh, all these crises um, show that in many cases it is not possible to interpret very traditional rules or principles such as Pacta Sunt Servanda or Clausula Rebus Extantibus on the same way as it was before. Uh, so because of all these crises, uh, there are uh, a lot of new rules uh, that in fact limit freedom of contract, uh, that, uh, that in fact influence on some traditional uh, change of some traditional civil law institutes. I would say that, for example, Dacia Insolutum, because of financial crisis uh, in uh, our country, there was some rules on mandatory Dacia Insolutum in favor of consumers. Uh, then there is a lot of new obligations for traders, new rights for citizens. Uh, there is also uh, a lot of new measures for protection of homeless citizens, uh, insolvent citizens, uh, some new instruments against insolvency, for example, personal uh, bankruptcy. This is something what is quite new. Um, new rules on access to services of general interest where freedom of contract is limited. Uh, in favor of consumers and uh, against traders, suppliers. And here are only a few examples from Croatia that shows that on one hand, um, judicial practice uh, uh, had to change the way of interpretation of some very traditional rules. For example, uh, here uh, are some uh, examples about interpretation of um, rules on uh, prescription because of protection of unfair contract terms uh, for consumers and because of collective address that was uh, used as an uh, instrument for protection of consumers, our Supreme uh, Court uh, changed the interpretation of uh, counting uh, of uh, limitation period and connected uh, this with initiation of civil proceedings. Uh, or, for example, um, because of financial crisis, specifically because of consu uh, consumer credits in Swiss francs, uh, a specific law was enacted on conversion of credits in Swiss francs to euros. That was again a limitation of freedom of contract and new rules uh, about the new legal obligations uh, for uh, creditors, credit institutions. Uh, also, uh, because of COVID crisis, there was also a lot of new rules on uh, um, enforcement proceedings on suspension or bankruptcy proceedings. Now we have new rules on um, prices for energy, 
So uh, there are it's again a kind of uh, limitation of freedom to contract because uh, government decided to fix the prices of uh, some energy uh, for consumers. So we can see that um, although in the very beginning when we start with, with our reform and when we based our reform on very traditional uh, civil law principles, freedom of contract, party autonomy, that now because of all this crisis, in fact, we changed the concept of many civil law rules and that in the moment we have much more mandatory rules, not only because of crisis, I think also because of EU law, because EU consumer law is more or less mandatory uh, law, so, so EU uh, harmonization with EU law also changed the, the nature of, of um, uh, contracts uh, rules. And after all these um, uh, challenges in reform, I think that now it's a time for um, reform, uh, uh, recodification uh, of um, civil law that now we have to reconsider how to uh, put all these rules again together, uh, how to uh, make a new system of civil law uh, codification. I think that we uh, need to discuss how to make optimal um, relation between uh, dispositive and mandatory rules, between uh, protection of some uh, specific social values, uh, what is the optimal level of generality when we are talking about uh, civil law rules. And something what I think that it is very important when we are talking about um, uh, further developments of civil law is how to achieve effective enforcement of individuals' rights. I think that uh, in Croatia, at least in Croatia, it is one of the biggest problem because we have uh, not only, we need not only um, excellent uh, civil law rules, but we also need uh, uh, good um, remedies, uh, procedural rules to enforce rights that are guaranteed by civil law. Thank you very much for your attention.